Hi there all. Today we'll be discussing on transient tachypnea of newborn, which is possibly the most common perinatal respiratory distress that we'll be uh, seeing. How do you define a PTNB? It's a benign self-limited respiratory distress syndrome of term babies and possibly late preterm babies, which is secondary to delayed clearance of lung fluid. It accounts for nearly 40% of all respiratory distress. There are multiple terminologies that are used to you know, describe babies who come to you with respiratory distress at birth, um, late preterm or a term gestation. So the common terms that are used are transitional delay. So transitional delay, when you want to use that term, you have a baby who is coming to you with tachypnea and grunting at birth. But they usually subside within two hours and most of them by six hours and they'll be able to accept feeds orally. So all these terminologies, if you see, it's more of a retrospective assessment rather than, you know, seeing the baby and say, huh, this is transitional delay, this is TTNB and this is something else because every baby is going to present in the same way. When you say TTNB, transient tachypnea of newborn, even those babies are going to present with tachypnea and grunting. But the duration can last longer, even up to 72 hours. But they usually settle down by 12 to 24 hours and may or may not require some form of respiratory support. Prolonged TTNB is where this 72 hour mark is crossed. It lasts more than 72 hours. The pathophysiology is um, postulated to be due to increased asymmetric dimethyl arginine levels. Basically, what this ADMA does is it decreases nitric oxide synthesis, resulting in increased pulmonary pressures. So they are going to behave like, you know, pulmonary hypertension babies. And this tachypnea can last longer and may require more invasive forms of ventilation. So if you have a baby presenting to you with tachypnea and grunting settling within six hours, label it as transitional delay. If the baby is, you know, having uh, slightly more prolonged tachypnea and grunting and settling by say 12 to 24 hours or maybe within 72 hours baby is settling down without sepsis without you know something else causing this tachypnea and grunting then you can label it as transient tachypnea of newborn so why we saw that it is due to delayed clearance of uh, fluid in the lungs so why does this happen and what does normally happen See, during gestation, your pulmonary epithelium is actively secreting fluids and chlorides into the air spaces, that is your alveoli. During labor, what happens is a surge of um, catecholamines in the fetus, that's your adrenaline, your glucocorticoids. They make the lung switch from secretion of chlorides to um, absorption, active absorption of chlorides by your channels, your uh, sodium channels. But here, if the baby does not go through this process of labor or if the baby has some genetic problem, then this active absorption period is lost. And even in active absorption, what is important is the absorbed fluid should stay in the interstitium and go back into the blood vessels. If that is not going to happen, if it is going to rush back into the alveolar space, then you are again going to end up with basically fluid in alveolar space, right? Which is what is happening in your transient tachypnea of newborn. So let's see the pathophysiological mechanisms. Elevated airway liquid volumes. Why does this happen? Because the amyloride sensitive channels are either not functioning properly or they are inactivated due to whatever reason. So in this case, the liquid goes back into the alveolus, flooding the alveolar spaces. If uterine contraction again is ineffective, then there's no lung fluid you know, efflux via the trachea. So basically the lung fluid gets pushed back into the trachea. You see babies coming out with lots of secretions and all that, right? So this lung fluid efflux does not happen if the baby is going to undergo a C-section compared to that of a normal vaginal delivery. Genetics does play a role, if it, especially this beta adrenergic hyperresponsiveness or this uh, uh, beta receptor polymorphism. And pulmonary immaturity. Why do you say pulmonary immaturity? Because what they have found is TTNB babies tend to have low phosphatidylglycerol concentration. And some surfactant deficiency has been documented in these babies compared to that of babies who don't go on to have um, a respiratory distress. 
How do these baby present? Tachypnea and grunting. Yes, they present shortly after birth. And the duration can last depending upon whether it is transitional delay, TTNB or prolonged up to 3 to 5 days maximum. Usually it is 12 to 24 hours for TTNB. So what do you expect to see a baby coming to you with uh, TTNB or what do you expect to see this baby look like in your labor ward? So this baby might be born through C-section. That's the usual case scenario. Sometimes through vaginal delivery. If it is through vaginal delivery, strongly suspect transitional delay rather than transient tachypnea of newborn. So this baby is going to chug away like a train. Ha, 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 ha. The chest might look slightly big, barrel chested, meaning the anteroposterior diameter is going to be increased. They will have grunting. Uh, uh, uh. This sound that you hear at the end of expiration is grunting. Basically, what the baby is trying to do is breathe against a closed glottis. So what does this do? This breathing against closed glottis is going to try to increase the PWP and the expiratory pressure, keeping the airways open, not collapsing upon itself. Some nasal flaring and minimal rib retractions can be seen. And on auscultations, crackles may be heard. And other findings, you might find a big liver and a spleen, which is basically pushed down because of your hyperinflated lungs. But these babies are going to be neurologically normal and there is going to be no sepsis. Make sure you rule out sepsis. That is always important. A baby who is going to have you know, continuous tachypnea, grunting, requiring oxygen support at the end of four to six hours. Keep sepsis also in mind. Understood. Don't say, Madam, this is only transient tachypnea of newborn. Yes, it could still be transient tachypnea of newborn, but we should never miss a sepsis, especially if there are pre-existing risk factors. You can always start on a basic prophylactic antibiotic like a ampicillin or a gentamicin, and you can always de-escalate those or stop those antibiotics if your uh, screen and your culture is going to be negative. Correct. But if you miss a sepsis, it will be very difficult to bring the baby back after, uh, you know, you have missed that golden period where you could have actually, you know, intervened and saved. Who can have longer duration symptoms? So now we saw that transitional delay is around two to six hours. Your uh, transient tachypnea of newborn is usually 12 to 24 hours, can last up to 72 hours. Is there any predictor to say this baby can have a longer duration of stay in the hospital? Yes, there are. If the baby is breathing very, very fast, grunting away continuously, and the baby is requiring oxygen support of more than 40% inspired oxygen concentration within six hours of life. If the peak respiratory rate in the first 36 hours is more than 90 breaths per minute, and in the background of the baby not having undergone uh, a natural labor process, absence of labor contractions or reduced labor duration, so these are all risk factors that these babies can go on to have longer duration symptoms. And these babies generally had a WBC count and a hematocrit level lower. Okay. Compared to babies with tachypnea that lasted less than 72 hours. So that's possibly a, you know, a soft lab indicator that this baby can have prolonged tachypnea. So clinically, Increased respiratory rate of more than 90 breaths per minute in the first 36 hours. Increased oxygen requirement more than 40% in the first 6 hours. Continuous grunting, not having undergone a natural labor clinically. And laboratory wise, uh, lesser WBC count and hematocrit level can point towards that this baby can go on to have longer duration of symptom. Why is this important? This is important so that we can anticipate things. And we can also advise the parents on what is the possible course the baby is going to have in your NICU. There are few investigational, um, investigational, in the uh, how can I put it in a better way? Uh, pre investigations, yes, that's the topic I've given. Experimental investigations that can predict that this baby can have TTNB. One is prenatal qualitative ultrasound texture analysis. And the other one is amniotic lamellar body counts. So these two can predict to some extent that this baby can go on to have TTNB. Post birth, the common thing that you're going to do is a blood gas and a sugar, of course, when the baby is going to come to you. What do you expect to see in your blood gas? You expect to see some mild to moderate hypoxemia, but generally normal PCO2 because this baby is going to be 
you know, breathing fast and washing out the carbon dioxide. Sometimes mild acidosis can be there. But if the baby is persist persistently worsening, worsening hypoxemia, increasing carbon dioxide buildup. So these are all signs that this baby is fatiguing a lot because of, you know, breathing so fast. And you should also always keep in mind, always keep in mind a baby who's TT and B is requiring oxygen support suddenly deteriorating, always rule out a pneumothorax. Okay, so this is a clinical point that you have to keep in mind. CVC is generally expected to be normal. The others are again experimental investigations that can say um, that can help you to rule in or rule out a TT and B. Endothelin 1 levels are higher in respiratory distress syndrome compared to that of TTNB. When you are having doubt in a late preterm, especially, you are not sure whether it is respiratory distress syndrome of you know prematurity or is it TTNB. Could be either of those, and both of them are going to present in the same way, but the management is going to be different. Right. So this can help you differentiate. If you want to differentiate between a sepsis versus a TTN, your interleukin 6 can help you. And your fetal pulmonary artery acceleration to ejection time ratio, again, it's going to help you to rule out or rule in your TTNB. These are all experimental. These you don't do it in routine practice. This is just for interest sake. I put these investigations. X-ray is one of the common investigations that you do. What do you expect to see? The most common thing that you expect to see is hyperinflation or hyperexpansion. That it's going to be prominent perihilar markings. Okay, and there will be depression of diaphragm because of hyperinflation. Flattening of diaphragm can be seen, and fluid in the minor fissure, as you can see in this X-ray. I think it is very, um, uh, it's not very clear. Well, wait, let me try to remove of all these. So, hope you are able to make it out now. If you can see, there's fluid in the horizontal fissure, and there can be interstitial thickening. So, these are all classical features of TTNB. So, if somebody is going to ask you what are the X ray features, you say hyperexpansion, flattening of diaphragms because of hyperexpansion, prominent perihilar markings or streaking, fluid in the minor fissure. Okay, so these are all classical features of your transient apnea of newborn. If you can do an ultrasound, well and good. Uh, in ultrasound, what do you expect to find if you are regularly practicing ultrasound? It is easier to understand this. Otherwise, uh, skip this slide for your theory exams. You can expect to see double lung point in a uh, less severe TTNB and it will be complete white lung, complete B lines if you are going to look at a severe TTNB. Plural line abnormalities can be seen. Plural line, you generally expect it to be continuous. You expect it to be moving, sliding across each other. But if there is going to be disappearance or thickening of plural line, or A lines is absent, plural effusion, you can consider TTNB. How are you going to manage? The ideal way is to actually prevent a TTNB from happening. You can prevent it by three things. One, if at all the patient has to have a LSCS, a elective LSCS that is, limit those elective LSCS to beyond 39 weeks of gestation. Antenatal steroids has been shown to be effective. And good APGAR score are going to again help in you know, preserving the surfactant and helping the baby um, uh, pass through the transitional phase easier. If the baby is going to come to you with transient tachypnea, TTNB, what are you going to do? The oxygen and ventilation is the primary mode of treatment and how much oxygen and how much ventilation depends on the baby. Initial, you can start with hood or nasal prongs if the baby is requiring an oxygen support if the saturations are below the age appropriate levels if the baby is grunting increased work of breathing and the oxygen requirement is more than 30 percent then a nasal cpap is an effective alternate treatment if the fio2 is even above 30 percent above 40 percent and requiring a good amount of pwp more than eight then invasive ventilation is required and if a baby is going to uh, go on to have invasive ventilation, alternate diagnosis has to be considered. A severe TTNB surfactant definitely helps maintain normothermia, hypothermia, denatured surfactant, worsening respiratory distress. Feeding in a baby with surfact, I mean, um, TTNB depends on how fast the baby is breathing. If the baby is breathing um, less than 60 per minute, then oral, direct oral feeding can be given. 
If the baby is breathing 60 to 80 breaths per minute, nasogastric or orogastric feeds can be given. If it's going to be more than 80, then IV nutrition. Especially if you are not, um, you know, intubating a baby, then IV nutrition. If you are intubating a baby, then once the baby stabilizes, you can give a combination of um, nasogastric feeds and IV nutrition. There is insufficient or lack of evidence to use antibiotic for a clear-cut case of TTNB. Restrictive fluid strategy does not help. Furosemide nebulization or IV does not help. Adrenaline similarly. Your salbutamol nebs do not help. Dopamine do not help. So do not use it unless indicated. The prognosis is good. It generally settles down within 72 hours. These children may go on to have easing syndromes later on in life and there is increased risk of uh, respiratory syncytial virus hospitalization in the first year of life. The complications can be prolonged TTNB, which is more than 72 hours of respiratory distress. Air leak syndromes like pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum has to be kept in mind in a child who is worsening suddenly and pulmonary hypertension. I think that's about transient echipnea of newborn. My reference is on and only Gomella neonatology. It was given very nicely. And I thought that is enough for us to understand the basic and it will be easier for you to go on to read uh, other things and gain more knowledge. So thank you guys for listening to me patiently. Share it with your colleagues, juniors, if you found this useful. And hope this helps you in your exam preparation and management of a child coming to you with tachypnea and grunting at birth. Thank you and all the best.